I thought I'd uh, get started by sitting on this couch that's gone unused for the whole uh, session and uh, just have a conversation with you about uh, some of the topics uh, at hand uh, about enabling Canada's uh, economy digitally. Uh, but I really can't sit here and, and have this conversation because it's something to me that's quite exciting, quite something that I'm quite passionate about. Uh, as was mentioned, I have the opportunity to look three to five years in the future try to avoid some of those unintended consequences that uh, we see with technologies. Carrie mentioned earlier with that fantastic 3D printer that, hey, you know, what's the implication of being able to print a knife? And those are the areas that I get to uh, chat about with policymakers. Those are the areas I get to talk about with entrepreneurs and large businesses to try to figure out, you know, what's this brave new world and how do you take advantage of this brave new world? Crisscrossed Canada had the opportunity to talk with entrepreneurs and big business around you know, how do you use technology, talk to governments, talk to the groundswell uh, uh, community. And, and what we're finding is top of mind for all these organizations and people and individuals is the economy. You know, certainly, we see uh, the media looking at the economic downturn, the worst since the time of the Depression, looking around the world, and we get um, almost daily reports about another country in crisis, another organization in crisis, another business in crisis seen the banking uh, collapse and uh, the ramifications of that. And I think we've also seen uh, the automotive industry uh, transformation and how that has changed the way that they look at the business. One great thing is uh, we as Canadians is that, hey, we've come out largely unscathed. Yes, there are some implications for us on a day-to-day -day lives, and we see that perhaps at the gas pumps, perhaps at the food prices. But if you look across the uh, uh, news reports, if you look at uh, Business Development Canada, Bank, Business Development Bank of Canada, come out and suggested that, hey, we're in pretty good shape. We're ahead of the race. We've been able to come out of that with that head start. Perhaps uh, we had Lens help, you know, kept our head down a little bit, uh, put on that special suit, did some wind tunnel testing. We're ahead of the pack. And so we now have a point at a point where we have a decision to make. Whether or not I use this clicker or not. <laughs> so we have, we're at a decision point. Do we do the typical Canadian thing? You know, we've running, we're running this uh, long distance race. We take a look back, we're ahead of the pack. Do we wait for people to catch up? Do we embrace them? Do we say, hey, come along, let's bring you along. And certainly I'm not an econo economist, simple engineer. And I know that there are some implications around you know, having your trading partners at a level of maturity that you can you know, trade with and have that advantage. But you know, do we seize the opportunity and move forward or do we wait for the others to catch up? Now, before we make that decision, you know, we're here at that fork in the road, let's consider perhaps something else that was happening about the same time. You know, so if we look at the time of the economic crisis, what else were people glued to their TV sets about? Well, the Chilean mine crisis. So we look at the Chilean mines, those 30 plus uh, individuals trapped deep beneath the earth for over 60 days. Now, I had the opportunity to uh, visit Santiago, Chile with some of my colleagues in the company. And uh, the leader of our group, Jonathan Murray shared this story around the largest mining company in Chile. They have a mine that is um, about 80 kilometers south of Santiago, Chile. It's their only copper mine that's uh, done underground now. The mining company Codelco is the largest exporter of copper in the world, generally open, uh, open pit mines. But this underground mine is uh, something that they were quite proud of. And they talked about the day in the life of the miner. And so they started off and you know, they collect the miners from the community. They put them in a, a bus to bring them to the face of the mine. They get changed. They go down into the mine. And then they spend all day in water, you know, noisy environment, dusty environment. And for the longest time, they're on jackhammers. So imagine you're in a constrained environment on the jackhammers. It really pays a toll on the uh, human body. Well, someone had the idea of saying, well, look, we're going to take this jackhammer away from this individual. We're going to give them this new device, this new robotic device they can control with a joystick. And so immediately, the life of this miner was uh, improved. So from the joystick, some six feet away from the device, then someone said, well, why is this person going down in the mine? And so they're able to put a long cable from the surface of the mine to the bottom of the mine and let these people work in a clean room environment, taking them out of harm's way, taking them out of the danger zone. And the company thought, well, you know what? These buses are costing us a lot of money. Why can't we let these people work from home? Well, interesting idea. But let's take it to that next step, that next logical step in the progression. Why are they just mining in Chile? Can't they just reach out and mine in Shibugamu, Quebec? Reach out over the web and be able to mine elsewhere in the world, have that center of excellence. 
And so as we start to look around this decision that we have before us, let's recognize that the competition's hot on their heels. Let's recognize, like uh, Daniel Plainview in There Will Be Blood, that people are waiting to drink our milkshake using the web. So we need to be careful and keep ahead of the pack and ensure that we have a plan to go forward with our strategies, with our economy. Go forward, not backwards. And so last May, Industry Canada started off with uh, some consultations on the digital economy. Now I've had the opportunity to talk with business uh, leaders across different business lines, be they supply chain logistics, be they manufacturing, be they automotive industry. And you know, one of the things that's a little bit disappointing is that not a lot of people were aware of this consultation on the digital economy. I'm sure if I ask for a show of hands here, that we probably have a similar type uh, scenario where people said, wow, there was, there was consultation. And it's really quite a shame because Industry Canada showed some world leadership in the way that they approached Canadians. They had a public website, they had a forum where you could register, they had a voting system where you could choose uh, and, and um, prioritize those things that you felt were important, and had this broad consultation, lots of input and lots of uh, responses. And one of the things that uh, I felt quite proud of after seeing this site was, you know, this vision statement, you know, our goal for Canada is to have a world-leading digital economy, to be a nation that creates, uses, supplies advanced digital technologies. So fun, some fantastic work that's happening there. And so when you think about that for a moment, you say, well, okay, so what does that mean for Canada's future economy? What does Canada look like in 10 to 20 years? Do we become that software foundry uh, that we know around the world? Do we become that uh, development shop for all these uh, different types of uh, cool content for products? Well, that's part of it. But I think if we take a step back and take a look at the broader context, we say, well, Canada's got much more vibrant economy than that. We have many more sectors that uh, fit into the economy. So as you think a little bit more about digi uh, enabling the digital economy, think about just looking around you and seeing where the economy is and where it's enabled digitally. So I, had, uh, I stayed last night at the Humphrey Hotel near the Forks, and uh, I looked across the river, well, across the street, excuse me, and I saw that uh, the Canadian Museum of Human Rights was being built there. So a construction site. I'm sure many of you have had the opportunity to drive by that uh, construction site. It looks like any other construction site. There's a crane, there's concrete being poured, and there's this uh, construction trailer beside it. So ask yourself this question, what do you think is in that construction trailer? Coffee table, coffee pot, water machine, you know, maybe the foreman's desk, maybe a telephone, but that's about it. Well, if you talk to the people that run those construction projects, there's actually a server in that office. And what do they use that server for? Digital blueprints. And so that the electrician can come in and talk with the plumber and they can figure out, well, that pipe, there's actually cable that has to run through that pipe. It's not simply sewage. And so as we start to look at those different aspects of our economy, you know, you can pick one, pick fisheries. We see RFID chips being put into fish in uh, Newfoundland and allowing them to track the cod movements and start to realize that the cod stocks are coming back. And we see the uh, drill heads the, the wellheads that are being put into, uh, into Alberta. There's a server right at the end of the well wellhead to manage human resources. We look uh, at uh, some of the presentations earlier today uh, around uh, what we saw from Nicole around the space program and how that was computer enabled. We, we saw from um, Karen around, um, excuse me, around um, the MRI, not the MRI machine, but the sonogram and the material. Pardon me? Ultrasound, excuse me, thank you. We see that's digitally able. So it's important that we look at not enabling our digital economy, but enabling our economy digitally. So taking a look at all those aspects of our economy and how can we progress them using digital technologies? How can we expand the reach of those technologies from local to those extended regions? As we start to look at enabling our digital economy, excuse me, uh, our economy digitally, we have to start to look at, so how do we do that? What are some of the steps to take? What are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the challenges? Well, the Institute for Competitiveness and Prosperity took a look at regions across North America, and they looked at uh, the populous regions and those that are, are fairly successful. Ontario, Quebec, because of their size, were ranked within the top 16 uh, uh, regions. And unfortunately, Ontario finished 14th, and Quebec finished 16th. And at the conclusion of the report was the prosperity gap is a productivity gap. And the productivity gap is an innovation gap. So innovation is key. So we need to look at innovation and figure out how it fits into this new economy, this new way to enable our businesses. 
Now, innovation is often misunderstood. People think of innovation as that new widget, that new gadget, you know, that tool that we can use. There are other aspects to innovation. Some are improvements to our processes. How do we become more efficient? Some are reaching out to new customers. And some are developing whole new marketplaces, developing whole new marketplaces and being innovative in that approach. So if we were to imagine a whole new marketplace, and considering you know, a number of us uh, today have talked about the greening of, uh, of our business, uh, the need for environmental sustainability, carbon sequestering, and certainly if you look down the road at uh, University of Manitoba, they are world-renowned for some of their work at uh, carbon management and just those tools to do so. So some great innovation happening there, but what if we could take that to the next level? So imagine for a moment the Montreal Climate Exchange. Climate Exchange is a partner exchange to the Chicago Exchange. So what if we were to suggest that the Montreal Climate Exchange would become the NASDAQ for carbon? So we create an economic foundation based upon our fundamentals, based upon the banking system in Canada, something we're well recognized for. And we start to build a business environment, a marketplace for the carbon. All of a sudden, those innovations that are happening at the University of Manitoba, Saskatchewan, University of Regina, those innovations have a marketplace to go forward, able to build and sell those uh, tool sets to a, a vibrant community. We're able then to project that around the world into other initiatives. There's the C40 Cities Initiative, where the City of Toronto was chair of that uh, community, the 40 most populous cities in the world, trying to figure out and come to terms with what it means to manage carbon. So being able to take that leadership, take those tools, take that marketplace, and bring that to market. So being able to then build out that next generation economy, be able to build out that digital part of the economy. So how do we build this out? There's two pieces. The one piece is innovation and talked about the innovation across the different sectors. The next piece is around people. Let's not forget about the people. Often when we think about the digital economy, we think about the technology, we often forget about the people. Now I'm a big fan of Richard Florida's work about the creative class and the reason that uh, people come together. And Canada is spiky. It's not just because of this silly building in uh, Toronto that we're spiky. Or perhaps this uh, building here in Calgary or over in Calgary we see that happening out in Newfoundland. This is where I insert the funny Mac joke <laughs> on Signal Hill. We also see that up uh, in uh, none of it with uh, Mount Barbeau and here in Winnipeg. We see innovation happening around uh, the communities and we see people wanting to grow into those communities, bringing people together, creative people cluster together and are able then to generate uh, value to the community and build upon the economy. So why would people want to come to these locations? Increasingly, we're seeing people wanting to move to locations for quality of life, a great place to raise families, uh, perhaps a different approach to how they run their business. So when we look at uh, the world becoming flat, it provides us the opportunity to reach out and extend our reach across broad communities, take our expertise that we understand and move that out around the world but still locate around those people that are important to us, that can share ideas. I had a, a bold idea when I first uh, joined Microsoft from the federal government. I had this idea of creating a center of excellence in Eastern Ontario. And I talked to uh, a colleague of mine at Carleton University and I said, you know what, we're gonna create a virtual team and we're going to share ideas amongst this virtual team. And it was spread out around uh, eight hours of highway driving between uh, the different uh, communities. And he pulled me aside and said, John, you know what, that's all fine and dandy, that's great, but there's nothing like coming to the office in the morning with your cup of coffee, reaching out to a colleague, and then having this dynamic session. And I'm sure many of you have experienced that today during the coffee breaks, during the lunch, about having these fast neuron conversations, these spontaneous conversations that might not have happened over a web chat, that might not have happened over uh, perhaps that distance, uh, this distance portion. And what we see is these communities coming together and then being able to extend that around the world. And so, for example, when we look at the sonogram work, and reaching out and extending that across the community. I had the chance to talk with uh, the CTO of University Health Network in Toronto, and he talked about this great work happening at uh, the Canada Health Infoway called telepathology, the ability to take an image from Iqaluit and share it with a community of 40 people across Canada to do their findings, to take a look at those medical screens, be able to provide their findings and report back in hours what used to take weeks. Imagine coupling that with then this uh, innovative work that's happening here in the province, extending that reach, having that excellence there, learning from the community there and extending it. 
So in addition to the innovation, we have to consider the people and be able to extend that reach in our economy digitally. So it's up to all of us to seize the opportunity to take that head start we've been given, to take this opportunity where we've come out of the wind tunnel, we've hit the podium and now move forward. And we need to look across all our businesses, all our different parts of the economy, be they healthcare, be they education, be they even government and the open government activities that we have happening here across Canada and move those forward so that we can create a prosperous Canada for the next 20 years. Thanks so much.